Hello and welcome to presentation number three, Cement and Other Cementitious Materials. In today's presentation, we're going to be going through the history of cement, the cement manufacturing process, the chemistry of cement, different types of cement, and finally, supplemental cementitious materials. But let's get started with the history of cement. A short 30 years ago, it was discovered that concrete dates back at least to 7000 BC. It was discovered while a road was being built in Yiftah El in Galilee, Israel. What was discovered was a lime concrete floor. Lime concrete is produced by burning limestone, which will generate a quicklime. Quicklime, when mixed with stone, will produce a product similar to concrete. Fast forward now to 2500 BC when the building of the Great Pyramids took place. Here, a cement-like material was actually used to bond the stone together. Some claim this was a lime mortar, while others claim it was burnt gypsum. The difference is, is that lime mortar is essentially a lime putty, which, when mixed with sand, can become a bonding agent. Burnt gypsum is essentially plaster of Paris, which has the ability to set quickly. If we now move up to 500 BC, we see that the Greeks were using lime mortars to build their temples and their palaces. And if we move ahead to 300 BC, we find out that the Romans were actually using Pozzolan cements for such structures as their theater in Pompeii, which would seat 20,000 people and still stands today. The Greeks and Romans soon became masters of this material, adding crushed stone, broken brick, and broken tiles to the material to make it even stronger. This is the first example of modern concrete. Modern concrete means a material that actually had a coarse aggregate, a fine aggregate, some sort of cement lime and water. The photo on the right is John Smeaton's lighthouse at Eddystone. This marks a milestone in cement and concrete history as he was the first to use a hydraulic lime, meaning that his lime would set underwater. This was critical off the treacherous stormy waters of Eddystone. Other milestones include James Parker's patent of the clay lumps that were left after burning limestone. These lumps actually were clinker. We'll talk about clinker in a moment. But by far the most important is Joseph Aspen's patent of Portland cement in 1824. He named it Portland because the final product resembled the Isle of Portland off of the English Channel. This name, Portland Cement, still stands to this day. By 1847, William Aspen, Joseph's son, discovers that by increasing the amount of limestone and burning it hotter, makes a slower setting much stronger material. However, to do this, he creates what is known as the beehive kiln. A couple of other milestones were that in 1868, America receives its very first shipment of cement from England. Needless to say, this new building material caught on quickly, and a short three years later, America opened up its very first cement plant in Copley, Pennsylvania, in 1871. Then, in 1885, Frederick Ransom discovered that if you burn the material even hotter, then what you'll get is a much stronger material. Therefore, he invents the rotary kiln. However, his rotary kiln is vertical. It has a diameter of about 18 inches and is about 15 feet high. Now, interestingly, about 10 years later, Thomas Edison was attempting to develop an ore milling process to concentrate low-grade iron ore. Edison found that he could sell the waste material to the cement manufacturers. In 1899, he decided to investigate how he might transfer his rock-crushing technology to the production of Portland cement. During the next few years, Edison made other improvements in the cement manufacturing process, the most important of which was the long rotary kiln that he licensed to other cement manufacturers. Edison also decided to build his own cement plant in Stewartsville, New Jersey. 
The kiln actually led to the overproduction in the industry, and Edison's cement plant was never particularly profitable. However, he didn't really care as he was already a billionaire by this point. But Edison's Portland Cement Company provided cement to many structures, including New York's Yankee Stadium. Now, though the technology to produce Portland cement has improved tremendously since Edison's time, the steps in the process of producing Portland cement has not changed much. Let's now move on to manufacturing Portland cement. The cement manufacturing process begins at the quarry. Stone mined from the surface contains high amount of silica, iron, and aluminum oxide, while stone deeper contains less of these minerals and more calcium carbonate. The manufacturer will vary the amounts of each of these stones to produce the type of cement that they wish to achieve. Usually blasting is necessary to obtain this rock. Once the blasting is complete, loaders will move in fill dump trucks to capacity, and then the dump trucks will haul the material to the cement plant, which is always nearby. Once at the plant, the trucks will dump the stone, which may be as big as a couch, into what's called the primary crusher. The primary crusher will reduce them down to about the size of your fist. A constant spray of water is fed onto the conveyor to keep the dust down. These rocks are further reduced in what is called the secondary crusher. Rocks high in calcium carbonate and low in calcium carbonate are crushed separately. Now the two types of rock are proportioned and placed into what's called a roller mill. Depending upon what minerals are already present, additional silica, iron, or aluminum oxide may be added. Once in the roller mill, they will be mixed together to produce a fine rock powder known as the raw meal. This rock powder is now fed into the preheater. The preheater will remove 95% of the carbon dioxide in the rock material, isolating the lime, the most important part of the cement. From there, the material is fed into the kiln. The kiln is set at an angle so that it is a continuous process. A kiln will turn about two revolutions per minute, slowly moving the material through the kiln. Inside the kiln, it can get extremely hot. This time lapse shows the temperatures at various locations, and up top you can see the average temperature in Celsius inside the kiln. Now this shot will give you an idea of how large it is inside the kiln. Now once the kiln hits about 1500 degrees Celsius, the powder begins to fuse itself together and forms what is known as clinker. This is marble sized gray lumps that come out the other end of the kiln. Now once the clinker leaves the kiln, it will be cooled quickly, typically down to about 70 degrees Celsius. Once it is completely cooled, it will be stored, and it will remain stored until final grinding. In the final grinding process, gypsum is added to the powder. The amount of gypsum that is added will depend upon the type of cement being made. However, it is important to note that gypsum is added to delay the set of the cement. So this final grinding of the clinker and gypsum takes place in what is called a ball mill. The ball mill is exactly that. It's a mill that slowly turns with metal balls in it to crush the gypsum and clinker together. The added gypsum will also control some shrinkage. And then lastly, tests will be performed on the cement before it is bagged and or shipped. And lastly, here is a shot of a typical cement plant from the outside. Now, we've already discussed some of the minerals of cement and how cement is manufactured. I'd like to take a moment now and talk about the chemistry of cement. There are essentially five compounds that make up over 90% of a cement. How these compounds are proportioned will determine the performance of each cement. 
The first compound is tricalcium silicate, annotated as C3S. C3S hydrates and hardens quickly. In general, C3S is responsible for the initial set and early strength of concrete. Furthermore, tricalcium silicate can range anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of the cement. Next is dicalcium silicate or C2S. C2S hydrates and hardens slowly. In general, it is responsible for the later strength or the strength that is gained in concrete after seven days. The amount of C2S in a cement could range from 5 to 40 percent. Next is tricalcium aluminate. C3A liberates a large amount of heat during the first few days of hydration. C3A also plays a smaller role in the early strength development of concrete. The proportions of C3A will range from 5 to 15 percent in cement, and it is very important to note that the lower the amount of C3A, then the more resistant your concrete and cement will be to sulfates in soils and water. The fourth compound, also proportioned at about 5 to 15 percent, is tetracalcium aluminoferrite, C4AF. This is the resulting product when iron and aluminum raw materials are used to reduce the clinkering temperature during the cement manufacturing process. The last material, which we've also discussed previously, is calcium sulfate, or gypsum. This is added in the final stages of cement manufacturing. It controls the hydration of C3A and also controls drying shrinkage. It is also considered to play a lesser role in strength development through 28 days. This is actually a product that many of you may be familiar with because it actually is Plaster of Paris. Now we've already discussed the fact that the proportions of these compounds is going to influence the performance of the cement. Let's go ahead now and look at the different types of cement. Type 1 cement is a normal general use cement. Its application would be reinforced buildings, bridge decks, concrete masonry units, floors. In fact, it can be used anywhere that the special properties of the other types of cement are simply not necessary. Type 2 cement is considered moderate sulfate resistant cement. It is used wherever moderate sulfate attack is likely. It is used for normal structures that may be exposed to soils or water where the sulfate content is higher than normal but not unusually severe. Now you may recall that when we were discussing the chemistry of cement, we said that in general, less C3A means that the cement is more likely to combat sulfates in soils and water. Well, type 2 cement, it is required to have less than 8% C3A or tricalcium aluminate. Type 3 cement, often referred to as high early, is exactly that. It is high early strength cement, used wherever it is important to achieve a specified strength at an earlier age. Chemically speaking, type 3 is similar to type 1, with the exception of the particles of type 3 have been ground finer than that of type 1. Type 4 cement is low heat of hydration cement. It is going to be used wherever the heat of hydration must be minimized, such as large gravity dams and any type of a large massive concrete pour. Type 4 cement is not normally produced in North America as we have found more economical ways to reduce the heat of hydration. As an example, we use supplemental cementitious materials, which we'll be talking about in a moment. Type 5 cement is high sulfate resistant cement. Like type 2, it fights the deteriorating effects of sulfates in soils and water. 
However, type 5 is used wherever the environment is known to have unusually high levels of sulfates. And that covers the five basic cements. However, there are many other different types of cements. For example, there is type 1A, 2A, 3A. These are air and training cements. Type 2MH is a moderate heat type 2. Blended cements typically contain various supplemental cementitious materials such as fly ash, slag, or microsilica. Type IP is a pozzolonic cement, while type IS would have slag added to it. Even these only begin to touch the surface of the various types of cement that exist in the market. And a quick note before moving on to supplemental cementitious materials. There is also on the market, and is quite common nowadays, what is referred to as a type 1-2. Type 1-2 cement proportions the amount of tricalcium silicate, or C3A, to meet the specifications of both a type 1 and type 2. And now let's finish up this presentation with supplemental cementitious materials. Supplemental cementitious materials, or SCMs, are exactly that. They are materials that are added to cement to enhance a particular performance of the cement. Some of the more common SCMs include fly ash, which is a byproduct of the combustion of pulverized coal. Slag, which is made from iron blast furnace slag. Microsilica, this is a byproduct coming from the reduction of quartz. And metacalin, which is produced from highly pure kaolin clay. Let's take a look at these individually. Some of the positives of fly ash is that it'll typically decrease the water demand by anywhere from 1 to 10%. Workability overall is improved at a given slump. Bleeding is typically reduced, and later strengths are increased. Some of the negatives of fly ash include the fact that air and training agent may need to be increased. You increase the potential for plastic shrinkage cracking. You also have to increase your curing time. Early strengths are typically affected using fly ash. And many people don't like the low dosage rate. You can only use between 10 and 15%. Nowadays, it's cranked up a little bit to about maybe 20%. And finally, set times may be affected. Next is slag. The positives of slag include the high dosage rates. You can replace the cement up to 50%. Typically, it decreases the water demand by up to 10%. And again, workability is improved at a given slump and later strengths are greatly increased when using slag. The negatives of slag, like fly ash, is there's an increased need for curing. There is also an increase in bleeding. Early strengths may suffer due to the fact that you are using a low cement content. And finally, set times are also affected. Using microsilica is going to greatly improve the permeability of your concrete. You're also going to get very high strengths using microsilica, typically over 10,000 PSI, depending upon the dosage rate. And finally, you're going to get a much more cohesive mix when you use microsilica. Some of the drawbacks of microsilica is that it is very difficult to finish. The water demand varies widely mix to mix. It is very prone to cracking, and finally, curing is extremely difficult when using microsilica concrete. And lastly is metakaolin. Metakaolin is one of the more common natural pozzolans. It is used wherever low permeability and high strength are required. However, in these applications, it is typically used as an addition to the concrete and not as an SCM. It is usually dosed at about 10% of the cement weight by mass. And lastly, a couple of things to remember about cement is that cement and concrete are proven products, been around for over a thousand years now. 
and also manufacturing has drastically improved since the 1920s and that cements are different they vary cement to cement and SEMs or supplemental cementitious materials do assist cement properties.